turn to would you turn with me in your Bibles this morning? Open your Bibles to Luke. Gospel of Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I hope you realize, I miss this sometime, I, I got to take, take a minute to let you know how much I believe I take the Bible for granted, but you know when I say to you and give you the, uh, the opportunity to open your Bible, what a privilege that is to open your book, open the Bible, God's Word, this is God's Word, and it's the most important Word that we'll ever have. That's what I'm going to talk about today, but I want you to know this. I want you to know that the devil will do all he can to take that word away from you. I want you to know that. We've been talking about powers that be. And I would like to talk about the power of our sovereign God who controls all things, who controls nature, sustains nature, all this great universe, who controls and sets up powers to be, including our government. A God that will never leave us nor forsake us. I'd love to talk about that power, but you know, you got to deal with the reality. And there is a power. And that power is satanic power. And that power is awake and living and viol violently dealing with God's people in this world today. And so, I just want to ask you to pray for me. Because any time you start dealing with the devil the devil starts dealing with you. You understand that? Because he's been in me this week. He didn't like what we're doing about this. I think far too long, we as churches, have kind of swept the devil under the rug. And I believe we're paying a price for that. We're going to have to come to grips with what Jesus died for, that is, that is sin. And he died for our sin. And what he's done with us in, in making us know that, he's made sin sinful. There are a lot of people know sin, but they don't know it's sinful. The Word of God will teach us by the Spirit of God that sin is really sinful. And when we understand that sin is sinful, then we'll understand the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, it's a privilege to open the Bible. It's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our paths. What, a, what an instruction God has given us to live in this world. And yet it seems to me sometimes we, we take it for granted. I know I've already said I do, I do, and I expect most of you do at times. But I pray that God would really revive in our hearts the great need of the Word. And I think we're seeing that in the world today. I believe there's more interest in the Word of God today than there's ever been before in my lifetime, maybe, maybe even in the world. And I believe that's an indication of what God is doing. Always remember that every revival in the church that's ever been, there's also been a revival of Satan. You think about Ezra in the Old Testament and Nehemiah who rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem. Do you think they didn't have any resistance? No, there was a sand ballad and a tabai there. See, when the Word of God gets to really going the way it ought to, then it's going because of persecution. It's going because people, of God's people, see the great merit of the Word of God in, our, in their lives. In this book, chapter 9 or 8 of Luke. Here's a place in the gospel. There's also two other gospels that account of this seed that Jesus dealt with of the gospel. And that's what the seed is. I'm about to read about the seed, and that is the gospel. But I want to, what I want to show you and ask you to help me with is this is a familiar gospel. You know this yourself. I know you do. But, but how di the devil dealt with it. That's what really stood out to me. I read this before too. And what a thief we have, and what a liar we have in the devil. 
and uh, what he does to destroy us. You know, uh, we ought to be more fervent in our love for God's Word. We ought to be more vigilant in our lives, asking God to open our hearts and minds to His precious Word. I can tell you I have, uh, I have missed so many blessings in fellowship with God because I've let the devil steal His Word from my heart. I have made a mess in a lot of parts of my life for no other reason than neglecting to obey God. I have seen that in my family. I have seen it in some of you. So I'm here today to ask God to help us see the great merit of God's Word. I see little children in this congregation. I see mothers even holding little babies. And I want you to be willing to be committed to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I know you're doing that, but don't think you won't find some resistance. That's all I want to say. It's not easy when we rejoice in God's Word because we have a power, and this power of, of Satan is greater than ours. There's only one power above his. Jesus is that power. That's why what Jesus did on the cross that old sweet story is so profoundly important that we go over and over to ourselves and preach that gospel in our hearts. And the power that He gives us. There's no life too far gone that Jesus and God's grace can't repair it. While the cross itself is about repairing the irreparable. And we need to see that and ask God to help us. His word is sure. All right, let's look at these verses. Um, in chapter 8 of Luke, if you're there with me, the first part of that book, that chapter, uh, Jesus gives the parable. And he does, does that as a sore. And a parable is teaching, um, uh, using a, an object lesson. Many of you teachers know the importance of that. And so Jesus is forming a word picture. And you might think of a, somebody sowing some seed. And he says that sower is, is Jesus, really. But it's every believer, every saint of God. You are a sower. And then the seed, he deals about this parable and how he, he went on and he, he, he addresses four different types of ground this seed was thrown on or cast on. And, and he looks at that as our heart, okay? And so the thing about a seed that, that I want you to know and remind you of before we read this is a seed has life, life. I want you to understand with me that no man, no scientist can make a seed, okay? Only God can make a seed. Now you can take a seed, scientists can, and they're doing that in agriculture, and they, they put situations in it. I know there's cotton seed that, uh, that I believe is, is a seed that you can put certain herbicides on the plant when it comes up and it don't hurt it. It's resistant to things. Uh, it can be resistant to certain pests and, and diseases. And, and it's a seed that has that sort of um, uh, been improved to increase the yields. And that is a great blessing from God uh, for our agriculture industry. But you can't make a seed. God makes the seed. So the seed that we're looking about is a seed that has power. It has life. You might think of the seed as two parts, the husk and the kernel. The husk of the seed, I believe, would be likened to the Bible. The whole book of God is like the husk of God's seed. But the kernel itself, is Jesus Christ because in him and him only is life okay so you can see can't you how Satan does not like the seed of God's Word he does not like the seed because you know why he knows what happens when it takes root in your heart he knows when a person believes 
that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, they will be saved eternally. There's not a person in this universe that has lived or ever will live that can't be saved if they want to be. Did you hear what I said? It means that God puts in our heart the desire to come unto him. Is that in your heart today? Then the word of God means something to you. And we need to be about the business of understanding how we need to protect it and examine our hearts to make sure it can grow the seed like God wants it to grow, okay? So Jesus has explained this or explaining this parable. And so now in the explanation, we're going to start our text at verse 9. And he says, and his this parable be. You have a question about your life. You have a question about what's going on in your life. You go to God, okay? God has the answers. They didn't, might not understand it. So many things I don't understand. But you know what? Go to God. You ask him, God, what does this mean? And so Jesus says now, he's going to interpret this, and he said unto them, and he said, Jesus, that is, said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. To others in parables, that seeing they might see, and hearing, or they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. See, the word of God doesn't mean everything. Doesn't mean the same. To everybody. Why, you would think, you would think, wouldn't you, that as much as the gospel is promoted in the world, on the internet, uh, everywhere, you would say, well, gosh, why is there any evil in the world at all? But we know, I'm going to tell you, what we see in the world today, in corruption, in the government, in society, that does not surprise a Christian. You know why? Because there's two factors that contribute to that evil primarily. Number one is the world. This world is a sinful place because it's under the curse of God. And so secondly, the world, and it constantly wants to draw the word of God away from you and me. And then secondly, your heart, your fallen heart. The heart of man, Jeremiah says, is evil and desperately wicked the heart of man Jesus even said that he said it's what comes at us in the heart of man so our heart is evil it's desperately wicked why because of the sin of Adam we are all sinners we are all in the same boat and there's no news for us to say well you know I'm better than you or you better we're not we need Jesus Christ we need the seed of his life in our heart and this is so important that we embrace that. And thank God that you have a glimpse of the truth of God. That the Word of God means something to you. That you may not understand all that God has given you in it to understand. But I'm going to tell you this. Satan is one of the greatest theologians that's ever been. Because he knows what believing and trusting in Christ is all about. And he does all he can because he doesn't want to lose you. He wants to hold you. He wants to grab you. He wants to bring you down. And we're going to talk about that. And we see that here in this parable. Now the parable in verse 11 is this. The seed is the word of God. That's what the seed is. It's the word of God. Life. It's what the word of God is. We need to handle the word of God with humility we need to read the Bible on our knees every day we don't need to think we can take something from the Bible or add anything to it the word of revelation says when that happens that your name will be taken out of the word of life now that's impossible for a believer but that's what he thinks about his word that's why I wanted to say that you can't live in a world like we're living today that tries to water down the Word of God. We cannot live in a world and be happy and satisfied and have the wings of peace just flapping because that's what Satan tries to do. He says there's peace when there's not any peace. He says, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. 
if we think we're in a world today that can just be happy and just let everybody live and everybody be one, you know well as I do, we're heading toward this one global society, this one world religion. And Revelation predicts that. And we're seeing that. We're right at the door of it today. Then it doesn't matter what you do. There's a way we can justify. You be real careful. Because that's how the angel of light, that's how Satan operates. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to steal the word, the truth, from your heart and mind. And he gives us the counterfeit of it. But it's the word of God. Remember that. It's not the preacher's word. It's not your mama's word, your daddy's word. It's God's word. You handle it like it's God's word. It's not about opinions. It's not about uh, dogma. It's about God's word. It's what God told us about him that he wanted us to know about him. It's what God told us about life and how he wants us to live. It's what God told us about salvation and how he accomplished it. And then he says in verse 12, those by the wayside... Now this verse, I want you to listen real close, kind of the meat or center of what I wanted to say today. Those by the wayside are they that hear, that cometh, then cometh rather the devil. You see what's happening? Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now that's, that's kind of the center of what I want to deal with today. I've entitled what I want to try to say, the gospel grabber. The gospel grabber. I know that's kind of a, a redneck, corny way to approach a, a title of God's sermon, but that's how I see the devil, kind of. He's just like a gospel grabber. And I think this verse supports that in so many ways. What he wants to do is to grab the gospel out of your heart. He wants to grab you. He wants to pull you down. There's three points I want to make. One is that Satan holds us down. That's what he wants to do. Whether that's a sinful habit, he loves that. He holds us down. He does it with doubts. He does it with fear. He does it with thoughts. Various ways. He holds us down. You might think of it like this. Imagine with me going and looking down a, a hallway of a great motel or hotel somewhere. And just imagine you're standing on the end door, uh, or end of the hall rather, and you're looking down the hall and every door, is ho all the rooms lined up on both sides. All the doors are open and there's arms reaching out to grab you as you walk down. That's how the Satan works. And it might not be some sinful lust, though it could be, I mean, it might be some doubt or fear. It might be some feeling that you have about somebody or some circumstance in your life. It might be some vacation home. It might be, it might be your children. It might be a, a lot of good things. It might be money. It might be success. But, but what he's trying to do is get you in there. That's what Satan does. See, it's not that money is so bad. It's not that how much money you got uh, is a litmus test of your Christianity. What matters, though, is how much of that money has got you. you. See, that's the difference. And so Satan is a gospel grabber. And what he's looking for is that seed. And when he sees the gospel, the word of God, he's going to get it if he can. Now, in this place, it's a hard place. See, it matters how our soul is prepared. See, this devil, he will sweep up that seed of the gospel quick. You know, when you see a roadkill on the highway, it doesn't take long for the buzzer to get there, does it? That's just like the devil. Next time you see one, you think of the devil because that's how Satan works. He is there. He is there to sweep down and take up everything he can get to in that way. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of the text, but he says, They on the rock are they, which when they hear, in verse 13, receive the word with joy and these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away in other words they uh, receive the word they have a joy in it for a while but what happens is they don't understand the cost of following Jesus Christ and so when you hit some hard places and you understand that our relationship is an ebb and flow and then there are some times 
that when Jesus has us in a rut and we fall, we have to wonder if we're even saved at all. We have to wonder how God is even working with us. We wonder if we've not gone too far, don't we? We do. That's exactly what Satan wants you to think. And they, or that which fell in verse 14, among thorns are they which when they have heard it go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to, per to perfection. There's so many things, and we have so many irons in the fire. We have so many things going on, so many things to do that it just chokes it out. We don't have time for God. We don't have time for His Word. We don't have time to do anything. We really don't know what we're doing. I mean, we're just going in a circle. We're just like a, a termite in a yo-yo, you know? We just don't know what to do. I mean, we're just going here and there all the time. And so we miss the blessings of God when we do that. So he says then, but that on the good ground are they, which is in, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. So what I want to think about is that's the heart that we all want. And God prepares that heart, okay? So that we understand as we examine our heart that we are guilty sinners. I mentioned guilt in my prayer a while ago and I hesitate to do that sometime because guilt has a bad name in the world today, especially in uh, psychology and other approaches. But you know, guilt is one of the great blessings we can have because guilt is how God, it's not God driving us away from him, it's holding up his arms because God would grab us. When we see our need and we see we've uh, strayed away from God, what a blessing it is. What a joy. We need to come back to him. Just like that son that left his father's house, the prodigal son, and he comes back. And here that father's meeting him, running toward him, wanting to embrace him. That's how God does us. Why? Because that prodigal had a guilt that he says, I don't have to live like this. Are you ready now to follow God's word? I mean, you know what? I think there's too many of us have tiptoed around in our lives and just said, well, you know, I feel like this, but I don't understand this. I want you to know this with me. I want you to know that if you're waiting to get everything in your life just right, if you think that you've got to get everything straight, you've got to straighten up before you come to Jesus, you have misunderstood the Word of God. Satan has just took that gospel somewhere along the way. Because this cross of Christ is not waiting for us to get good enough. Cross of Christ is where Jesus Christ saved us from our sin, his imputed righteousness. It's not our works, it's God's. It's his righteousness. And Satan, I'll tell you what he loves to do. He likes to make the gospel where he loves works. He likes for us to think we've got to work for our salvation. See, he keeps us on our pen, and that's discouraging because we know we can't make it like that. And Satan hates faith. That's why faith is so important. Why? Because that is like the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God is a sword, okay? And so when you see that, you can understand, Satan don't want you to cut him. He don't want to be wounded, son. He don't like that. So, so the Word of God, let's get rid of it. That's what he says. Okay. The good heart. It takes patience. We're not there yet. I know I'm not. I don't suppose you are either but it's worth waiting for. But we keep it. We hear it because he gives us a here and there. We keep his word and it brings forth fruit with patience. Now, for the application part, and maybe, maybe before we get to write, I want to say three things. I mentioned, first of all, I want us to see that God gives us his word. It's a great blessing. But when that happens, Satan hates it. I mean, that's, that's the bitter enemies. Satan has been after the seed of the woman since time began. And that is certainly Christ and his kingdom. And so we see here that, first of all, he, Satan holds us down. I want you to see this. We visited a scripture a while ago, a few weeks ago, from Luke chapter 9, verse 42, where a, a man had a son that was possessed with a demon. And he says, no, the disciples couldn't do it. So he takes him to Jesus. And the Bible says while he was going to Jesus the devil threw him down. And we see from that that Satan holds us down. He grabs us. 
He wants us to stay down. He wants us to be in that rut. And sin can be a habitual rut. And there's a power. I mean, friends, I don't have to tell you. It's hard to break out of that. And there's so many addictions. And you know this internet? I mean, you can be addicted to social media. A lot of people are. And I mean, it's, it, Satan uses that. It's his playground. And we need to be very, very careful how we deal with that life. Addictions, drugs and alcohol and sex and, and money and whatever. I mean, we, we have them. Why? Because we are fallen creatures. And so Satan tries to hold us right there. So we need to understand, though, as we do that, we need to understand that we're going to fall. Just because you fall, saying you're trying to struggle through an addiction, doesn't mean you're not a child of God. Satan, though, will try to steal the comfort of the gospel away from you. What it should do is understanding that we have a victory in Christ that is real. You get your eyes off yourself and you keep them on Jesus. You hear me? You stay on Jesus. And so when you get up, because the Bible says, the proverb says, the righteous fall is seven times and gets up. You get up. You know, I, I tell you, I'll just confess to you so many times, I have been trapped in the same kind of sin. And you know, you, don't you ever say, I'm not going to do that again. You're not, you're not, you're not going to get anywhere on your own self. <clears throat> you're not. Don't you ever say either, well, you know, I would never do what they did. Because you don't know. You don't know what you'll do. I'd be willing to say that every one of us, the only reason we haven't done what they did, so to speak, is because we had not been presented with an opportunity like they had. And secondly, and mainly because the grace of God has restrained us. There's no telling what this little boy would have done had not God's grace restrained me. I know how sinful I am. And that's another thing that the gospel does and why Satan hates it. It makes sin to flourish. Romans 7, the apostle Paul said the law, the law of God, what's he talking about? That's good. He said, but what it showed to me was my sin. When we see that, we see that Jesus Christ is our only remedy. And we go about our life rejoicing that we have a Savior that loves us so much. But here's the problem in how Satan pulls us down. You know, he is a prideful say, uh, Satan. He loves pride. That's what, that's what cast him out of heaven. He wanted to be bigger than God. And so pride always goes before destruction. That's what holds us down. Think about this from an alcoholic. I've had alcoholics in my family, and I've dealt with people in the church and people that I love that struggle with alcoholism. And I've never said that I'm better than they are because I know where I would be without God. And you better know where you would be without God. But here's what I've said. I've had personal accounts. A one was a brother that sat here not long ago and did his funeral, Brother Henry Smith. Many of you know Brother Henry. And he struggled with alcohol. He shared that with me. He wasn't ashamed of it because God was his power. But here's the way it happened. He said he went 30 some odd years after God blessed him with the strength of sobriety. But he said one night, one night, he had about a half a glass of beer. And that one half a glass of beer sent him back down to the very pits of hell, so to speak. Just one, that's all it takes. And what happens is this rut we get into where you might think, whatever addiction it might be, you know, you might say, well, I've got this now. I mean, you're kind of gloating in your sobriety. I haven't committed this sin lately. I haven't thought this thought lately. And then you get kind of feeling good about yourself. Be careful when that happens. And then you get to saying, well, you know, I can handle this. Maybe a little bit won't hurt. And when that happens, you look for the fall. We have to be understand that Satan is a is a liar that he but he behind that you know he's if you want to if you want to end up in the middle of nowhere you get on that long black train you remember that song Josh Turner May long black train I mean it sure looks good I mean let's get on and ride but it ends up in the middle of nowhere if that's where you want to go if that's where you want to go you listen to what Satan is telling you understand there's a power out there. You understand that none of us are going to escape that power because he is the prince of the power of the air. Doesn't mean that you're in church. Doesn't mean that a matter of rather that you're in church. Doesn't matter that you've grown up knowing this or that and the other. You understand there's a power that is trying to grab you and throw you down. 
We need to pray for our children. I do, I do, and I know you do, and our grandchildren. And we see that. And secondly, that we need to see, not only does Satan hold us down, you see what he's doing here? He's grabbing the gospel from Luke chapter 8, verse 12. But he hates the gospel, secondly. And he hates the gospel because the gospel is a story of salvation. The gospel is good news. And Satan doesn't want you to know that. He wants you to be complicated and think, well, you know, I've got to know this and that and the other, don't I? No, what you get to know is Jesus Christ. What you and I need to just come to him in simple childlike faith and understand that he, Jesus, is our Lord and Savior. He, he is the one. And you know, the thoughts that he gives us, Satan does. Oh, my goodness. He works on the mind. That's why we're told in the, in the Bible to make our minds to Christ, renew our minds in Jesus Christ. I imagine some of you already now have been bombed all by Satan. I'll tell you what he does. When the preacher gets to preaching, your mind gets to think about something else you need to do, doesn't it? I mean, you know, I've been in a congregation before. I know how it works. What is he going to say? He got, what am I going to have for lunch today? Don't, don't you think this preacher might be preaching too late? In front of me, what kind of dress is that? Or, uh, you know, I mean, all kinds. Of, Georgia got beat the other day. Florida beat Georgia. I bet, I bet Satan jumped on that so much in congregation, Georgia fans. <laughs> I mean, you know, what I'm saying is that's the mind. He gets in your mind. And so when we understand this is the Word of God, we got to say, I'm not going to put up with Satan dealing with me like that. I'm going to focus on Jesus. I'm going to focus on His Word. Because I want to tell you, friends, He will steal it from you. He will grab the gospel because He hates the gospel. But you know what I want to say this right now? If He hates the gospel this much, don't you think we ought to love it? I mean, if whatever Satan hates, wouldn't it think that we ought to love it? I mean, we want to say, God, God loves the gospel. I mean, that's the life of life. I mean, but Satan hates it. Shout the house down. I mean, you know, I love it. I love it. And then thirdly, um, that notice from our text, they, those by the wayside are they, that when the, when the devil cometh and taketh away the word out of their hearts. So what happens, here comes the devil. So my third point, my first point is Satan holds us down. Secondly, Satan hates the gospel, so we're to love it. But we know that he's going to do everything he can to take it away. And then thirdly, that Satan hurries to hinder us. The thing about the devil is he is always on time. He is not lazy. The devil knows exactly where to get to you at the right time and place. You understand that? He is a prompt devil. He's 24-7 at it. And so we need to see that, and we need to bless that. So he hurries to hinder us. Now, the reason he hurries is because from Revelation 12, 12, God turns the devil loose at the end time, and he knows he has a short time. So the devil knows he has a little time, and he's going to do as much evil as he can. The deal is, we don't think we don't have, we think we've got all day. Many of us think we're bulletproof. Many of us think that, you know, I've got this preacher. I don't have to worry about the devil. I'm going to tell you what. That's exactly how he wants you to be. But Satan's going to make the most of his time. We're not going to be here forever. We need to preach the gospel hope because when preaching starts, the devil gets roused up. And you're not only this preacher, but you and your family and your friends. And you know what? I was thinking this morning. I didn't start preaching. I was in my 40s. So I couldn't say. I had to start preaching hard. I didn't say I was a good preacher, but I'm going to say this. I want to try to preach hard. I got to. You know why? I didn't start until I was in my 40s. See, I went, I went a lot of time. I didn't say a thing about Jesus. And I want to make up for it. And, you know, I can't wait till I'm old. People say, well, you know, that Randy, he's not much of a preacher now, but he probably used to be when he was younger, you know. No, that's not the way it is. You know what we need to say right now? You need to tell your children. You need to tell your grandchildren. Your Bible study classes. You understand this. You don't have all day. 
Satan knows when to come. He needs, he's in a hurry to grab the gospel and take everything away from you that has any meaning. I want you to know that. So, preach hard. Sow the seed. Don't be discouraged. Because it's living word of God. And God's promised that his word will not come away void. It's going to serve God's purpose. You might understand it. You've already seen that he said that heart that's right is going to have patience. It's going to bring fruit at time. Doesn't mean it's going to happen all at once. I mean, a garden don't have vegetables time I plant it. You see, it doesn't. And so God's word is to be though understood that Satan, you have an adversary. That's the main thing I want to tell you. There is a power that be, and, and it's an evil power. Thank God that he's greater than that power. That's the only way we can have an understanding of it. Otherwise, Satan would take every bit of the gospel away, every bit of the word. We'd never have a blessing. We'd all go to hell. But God has given us his word and he's given us the spirit of God so that we have hearing air and seeing eyes. So you preach it. You live it. You make sure that God is using you in whatever capacity because, my friends, it's awful critical that we need to see what Satan is trying to do. And he's been good at it. He's, he knows how to do it. He's good at it because he's done it so long. And he's going to keep doing it in our lives. You know, when we... Think about it. It ought to be encouraging. I'm going to close, but we, we see the evil in the world. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 it's amazing. If you look at Bible history, when, when the evil gets really rising up, I mean, even if you look at the end times, that is just when good is going to take over. Evil never wins. It never does. And so when we see the rising of the, of the things against God's Word, and we see the evil nature of people being more prominent than ever, you know what, in a way we need to be encouraged because daylight always comes just before, I mean right after the darkest part of night, daylight does. And I believe that's in my heart for the gospel. And I believe that's why I want to tell you as a church, and that's why I want you to pray for me and every other preacher and everybody that we promote the Word of God, and you do it in your home. That's why God tells His people when they go in the wilderness in Deuteronomy, He says, you teach your Word. You do it when you're laying down and you're standing up and you're walking around. Because, my friends, the Word of God is salvation. The Word of God is the only remedy. And there's no virus, there's no government, there's nothing that's going to overshadow that. But what we have to be faithful is to be faithful in God's Word and be trustful and truthful. You know, he gives us armor in Ephesians 6. I think it's in verse 12 through 17. He gives us, I think there's maybe six pieces of armor. And we need to put it on. God says put it on. Shield of faith. To ward off the fiery darts of the devil. You know what? That's the word of God. That's what that is. Because he's throwing darts at your heart. And he wants you to fear him. He wants you to doubt. He wants you to give up. He wants you to just say it's okay for things to be wrong. He, he just, he's good at those kind of deceptive motives. And we're to have the breastplate of righteousness. We need to confess our sins. We need to be honest with God, every one of us. We need to understand that it's his righteousness, not ours. So don't you be so discouraged because of something you did in the past. You understand that Jesus has given you his blood as his covering, and you're righteous, and your sins, though it's scarlet, will be white as snow. He says put on the, the, the feet, uh, the shoes shod with the peace of the gospel. That means every opportunity that we have, wherever we go, we need to say something about Jesus and sometimes use words even. We need to be promoting what God's Word means to us in our life, and you're doing that today, and I appreciate you so much. And we need to encourage others. And the helmet of salvation, I believe we need to set that on and tighten it up and understand that God's Word has told me that I have assurance in my faith. I'm sure that Jesus died for my sins and that I'm going to be with Him in heaven. And my, all my hope is in God's Word. And all my hope is in God's promises. 
Well, you know, we could go on, I bet. But I pray that the Lord will bless us. You know, when Israel, when they were in bondage, the Israelites, and uh, Pharaoh was getting aggravated because Moses was bothering him about getting them out of there. You know, that's what the gospel does. It gets us out of bondage. That's why Satan wants to grab it. And you know what the Pharaoh did? He, made their, he doubled their work. You remember he made them uh, make more bricks? They did it. But that was just before Moses was sent. So when we have the evil onslaught, when we have the discouragement of the world, just be ready. God is about to do something really, really big. May the Lord bless you and keep you close to him is my prayer. Would you, would you bail with me for a prayer together? Dear most precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We ask you, Lord, to bless us never again to take it for granted. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us strength to, um, to look at our hearts, examine our hearts. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would break up the fallow ground that's in our hearts so that when that word is sown, that it will take root for your honor and for your glory. We believe that your word, every bit of it, has life, that kernel of Jesus Christ, for you are the living word. O oh Lord, help us scatter it everywhere in our lives. Make it come up to bring you glory and fruitfulness in your great kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.